My name is Gordon. I'm going to tell you a little bit about sort of my journey, how I got involved in mushrooms. I have a PhD in yeast and wine science, and I kind of took up the mushroom thing as a hobby. So there's, yeah, I started a mushroom account a couple years ago called Fast and My Fungi. It is now on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, iNaturalist. Uh, so yeah, my background is I am a Bostonian. I went to Santa Cruz for undergrad. One of the things I did at Santa Cruz, I took some summer abroad trips, and I got really inspired about yeast and fermentation. So I went to UC Davis and ended up working with a woman named Linda Basson. After graduating Davis, I was like, you know, I just got a PhD in wine. I should probably work at a real winery. So I solicited a couple places and I ended up at Opus One, um, which is not your everyday dinky little winery. It's a, it's a pretty major brand. Um, and I had the opportunity to do some really cool proof of concept science there. Uh, my partner and I went to New Zealand for a little bit where she was working at a winery bunch and I got bored. So I just started going for hikes and looking for mushrooms. And at some point I realized, I have hundreds of photos of mushrooms on my phone. What the hell do I do with these? Also, I have no idea what they were. Um, so I started just putting them on Instagram and I found this amazing community. I've met, met so many friends, learned so much. I was really inspired by it. But you know, my, my journey with mushrooms didn't start in New Zealand. I, as a kid, I found a football the size of my head and I forever remembered that spot. I can even remember where I found it today. And I've gone back endless times and checked. They were never there again. But I hope to someday find a football the size of my head that's perfect inside. Uh, my dad had also, uh, we had a stump in the yard, and he looked to talk to a guy to get it removed, and the guy was like, oh, was like $2,000 to remove a stump. My dad was like, nope, that's not happening. Um, so instead he found uh, online that he could order plugs for chicken in the woods, which is a really wonderful edible shelf mushroom. So he plugged up the stump, kind of forgot about it. Two years later, we had these bright orange mushrooms in the yard. We're like, what the hell is this? And my dad said, we can fry these up and eat them. Um, lo and behold, they were delicious, and I also never forgot about that. I transitioned then into an interest in yeast. Well, we all started when I was, let's say, seven or eight. My dad and I took a little trip to Belgium, to Brussels, and the whole time he kept talking about this sour, double fermented sour beer called the Creek. They'll make a Lambic, which is one pretty sour beer, and then those secondary fermentation with cherries. So he was geeking out on this, and he's a, he's a microbiologist, so that's part of where all this came from. But he was geeking out on this beer, and I remember sitting in this plaza, guys sort of playing soccer in the middle of the plaza, and the waiter comes out with this just absolutely beautiful sort of pink beer, the light shining through it, there's angels singing, and I'm like, Dad, what is that? He's like, that's a creek. He's like, holy shit, can I try some? I'm like, yeah, your mom's not here, go for it. So I had a sip, and then I kept having more and more sips, and I think at some point the beer might have gone. Um, good thing my mom was not there, but that, that inspired a lifetime of interest in microbiology and yeast, and we went back, back home and uh, tried brewing a lambic together. That worked all right, and we added cherries, it was really moldy, so that was another good lesson in microbiology. And again, on there, on the, the far picture is, um, that's the Grosbeak Parasiticus. So that was the first mushroom that I ran into in New Zealand. I was like, what the hell is that? I actually was able to identify it, find out it was an edible mushroom, and we ate a bunch of good bugs in New Zealand. So that was a great sort of proof of concept that yes, I can find mushrooms, yes, I can eat them, and I'm not dead yet. You guys have a broad overview of mycology, and honestly, I'm not qualified to do this. This is my first time giving a really extensive talk on mushrooms. I have 10 years worth of slides on wine and yeast and all sorts of stuff, but this is the first time I've put together a mushroom talk. Animals and fungi are pretty close, and animals and fungi are closer than plants. Um, and from this little tree here, you can see these are all the different uh, clades of fungi. These are the ones we'll be talking about since these produce the macro fungi that we eat but they are relatively close to insects because they all use kite. And again, just to sort of show you on like a big evolutionary tree, like mushrooms are down here and mammals and stuff are right here. A couple of different things about fungal life strategy. Um, basically three sort of general classes. There's saprophyte, which is uh, mushrooms growing on dead stuff. So mushrooms are sort of the decomposers of our world, right? They are what make the carbon and nitrogen cycle happen. Deep dive into examples of parasitism, where these mushrooms are preying on trees, and often something will be parasitic as well as uh, saprophytic because they can kill, kill the tree and then they'll eat its dead body. That's pretty metal. And then you can actually have mushrooms and uh, trees that are friends, and that's mycorrhizal association. And that's honestly like 90% of the plants on the planet have a mycorrhizal partner. Whether or not it produces a fruiting body is different. You know, fungi probably hit land before plants did. So almost every plant that's not a legume is associated with some form of fungi in some manner. Um, and legumes instead have recruited bacteria to fix nitrogen. From a sort of biological perspective, mushrooms live in their food. Uh, they don't go get food, they just sit in it. So what do they have to do? They have to produce mycelium, hyphae, things that will invade the woods. They produce a lot of enzymes, they're digesting the food that they're sitting in. 
Um, and sometimes they're low on nitrogen when they're doing that. So like oyster mushrooms are famous for having these little lassoes that go out and like, grab a nematode and suck all the nitrogen out of it. So they're excrete enzymes. Um, they're growing little fungal bodies, hypha and mycelium. Um, and those and they can sort of weaponize those two to really get into stuff or parasitic plant. There's things called rhizomorphs, these honey mushrooms that will send their rhizomorphs out. They'll invade between the, the bark and the tree, and they'll effectively girdle the tree. So they, you know, honey mushrooms can just kill trees. If you have a dead tree in your yard, the Bay Area, it's probably killed by honey mushrooms. And then you'll also see that mushrooms are full of beta glucans and chitin, and so these interesting polysaccharides, which is where a lot of the benefit comes from eating mushrooms, because you're getting beneficial polysaccharides that help to stimulate your Mushrooms are sort of split into two um, general categories. We have the Visidiomycetes, so the club fungi, and so that's the, the spores are on sort of as a club, and there's little spores dotted on the top of it. Of course, Ascomycetes are sac fungi, where the spores are in a little sac. So Ascomycetes con contains uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is the wine yeast that I actually know stuff about. Right? <laughs> so, here's kind of a cool uh, readout of all these different fungal life strategies. Um, so here, here's honey mushrooms. So this is full parasitism. So honey mushrooms are sometimes known as meadow makers. They will go out and they'll use those rhizomorphs to invade a tree, hurl it, kill it, eat its dead body, and then sporulate, you know, spread their spores to go kill more trees. And actually, the world's largest continuous organism is that gigantic patch of Marmalaria or honey mushrooms that's up in Oregon and it spreads like across three or four states and something like that. It's only like a couple centimeters deep, but it's this huge mass of mycelium. It's pretty wild. On the side of plant harm that's not, you know, totally parasitic, you have diseases like uh, coche or uh, corn smut, cedar apple rust, pretty wild diseases. Um, there are mushrooms that prey on other mushrooms, so there's lots of molds. If you've walked out and seen an old moldy mushroom, molds are going to town on it. You have like hypomyces, which is a really cool mold that will colonize the outside of a mushroom, then sometimes turn sort of a less edible mushroom into a more edible mushroom. Not all hypomyces species are edible. The most famous one you've probably heard of is the lobster mushroom. The yellow one is the hypomyces from the East Coast. I don't know the species necessarily, but it looks cool. It kind of like, it hides all the gills, it changes the, the structure, the gene expression of the mushroom. You have other stuff like these little powder caps down here. So this is like a big, dead, nasty russula, and you'll see these little powder caps pop up on top of it. Things that are exploiting the plants, you have things like mycoheterotrophs, so there's little ghost pipes. And these are non photosynthetic plants that are parasitizing and, and pulling sugars out of mycelium. So that's plants that eat mushrooms. And then you've got you know, the mycorrhizal stuff. Uh, mushrooms and plants are friends. Classic example is something like a chanterelle or a porcini. You guys have all seen <coughs> these, they're, they're delicious. Fungi that are called endophytes. And these are really cool. If I could go back to the second PhD, I think I'd go work on endophytes because they're just so fascinating. Um, but those are mushrooms that live inside of plants, inside and in between the cells, and they almost act like a de facto immune system. It's not always mutualistic, but you know, it's it's kind of a cool, cool subject. Mushrooms are ubiquitous and pervasive. They're friggin' everywhere, right? We're not just talking about mushrooms, we're talking about fungi. There's every surface in this room probably has some kind of yeast you could culture off of it. Fungi are associated with lichens, so that's a, a combo of uh, fungi that sort of forms a structure, the algae that does the photosynthesis, and then often some sort of yeast species that will actually help the conversion of the sugars from the algae to the, the base fungus. So it's sort of a combo of like three separate organisms. You've got mushrooms you know, spreading their spores, you've got uh, mycorrhizal. So this micro, the point of a mycorrhizal mushroom is that it will grow on the plant roots and uh, expand the surface area so they can take up nutrients or water, um, they can help detoxify soils, they, they really, really help plants. And mushrooms really, they change soil pH, they change structure, they're so incredibly important to our you know, basic soil chemistry. And when you have areas that have been completely deforested, the soil suffers, nothing can grow because there's not enough fungal species to help turn the mushrooms over. But at the same time, mushrooms will be the first one in there to start decomposing and turning stuff over and getting soils healthy again. So, you know, when we have super fun sites, let's send the fungi in. The fungi started in the ocean and moved to land. So, so there's a huge diversity of fungal fruiting bodies. We've got all sorts of stuff, truffles, these sort of subterranean things that hide on the ground. Um, Acidomyces, common ones like little cut fungi and morels. Blackness rubber, you'll see this in like wood chip beds all around the Bay Area, little bird's nest fungi, polypores, coral mushrooms, tooth mushrooms. Talk about the uh, evolution of mushrooms and the diversity of fungal fruiting bodies. Uh, what you can kind of see here, and honestly, go read the paper if you want the whole story, but stuff like jelly fungi and chanterelles actually remain relatively unchanged in evolutionary history. You can see some massive jumps in diversity in 
expectation? Is there, there's some, there was a giant sort of die off event, and after that, we saw massive diversification of fungi as a ton of stuff died off, and probably you know, huge amounts of organic matter sitting around. We saw a wide spread of diversification of mushrooms. You can see stuff like the russellas down here um, are more closely related to boletes, because russellas evolved gills separately from the rest of mushrooms. You see a lot of this in mushroom stuff where they have similar forms, but they're from totally different evolutionary lineages called convergent evolution. Um, there's a lot of ways to effectively spread spores, and so you see the same motifs over and over again, stuff like gills and teeth. So this is really just to point out that there is a staggering diversity of mushrooms. We have cataloged a, a pitifully small amount of the amount of fungi that are out there. A ton of work to be done, and, and that's again why, you know, you're an academic, like, go to my college, it's super interesting, I kind of wish I had done more of it, but also at the same time, seven years to PhD was long enough. <laughs> so we are sort of on the edge of a microcultural revolution, which is a fancy way of saying, I think mushrooms can really help us, right? I think, you know, not to be too hippie, but they can be our future, right? They can provide sustainable, high-quality protein, use them for building and materials and textiles, fungus bioremediators, biological controls for pests, uh, producers of medicines and bioactives, polysaccharides, immunomodulators, and of course, those powerful fungal enzymes, because they sit in their food and you gotta digest what's around you, right? I'm not talking about this because this is the future, I'm talking about this because this is right now. We use a huge diversity of fungal enzymes in all of the products we, we take for granted. Stuff like detergents are full of enzymes that have been derived by fungi. And what they did is they probably took the gene out of a particular fungi, dropped it into a yeast or another expression system, they grow it up in a bioreactor, they isolate that enzyme and then throw that in detergent. And that's probably done on like a thousand liter or hundred thousand liter scale because they're doing this all the time. We want to come from the wine industry, so we see a lot of, they'll use pectinases to help break down fruit to get better juice. We deal with uh, lactases in wine. They do a lot of browning of juice. Like I said, household items like amylases, proteases, lip lipases. These are, if you have one of those skate removers, I guarantee you it's like half fungal enzymes. Animal feed, environmental management. I mean, just, the list goes on and on. There's so many different capacity for these you know, fungal enzymes to help, help us with stuff. There's uh, municipal water systems that are using these lactase enzymes. And like I said, I'm used to lactases being hindrance to your process because they're causing sort of pre-oxidation, pre-browning of the wine. But in a different context, these lactase enzymes are very powerful bioremediators, and you can use them in, in water systems to get rid of poly uh, aromatic hydrocarbons and all sorts of stuff that you know we have unleashed millions of years worth of organic matter by burning it carelessly and shoving it all over the environment, and we're now facing the consequences, right? We're full of hormone disruptors, we're all getting cancer. Mushrooms might be one of the only ways that we can really effectively try to clean up our environment. It's not as easy as saying, well, I'm just going to put a bag of oyster mushrooms on this oil spill. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> mushrooms are great at taking stuff up, but all they're doing is, is concentrating, right? You're, you know, you're, you're magnifying it in one organism. And that's why, if you look at a mushroom box, a lot of them will say, hey, like, be careful, this one concentrates heavy metal. So, like, maybe don't pick it out of, you know, your local park and eat it, because there might be heavy metals there. That would part of pesticides or fungicides. Or, you never really know what was done in a space before you got there. Uh, so it's always, it's wise to sort of think about the history of a space and, you know, where you're getting the mushrooms from. I think, you know, this is just an idea that, again, here's a, actually a little bigger. So you could, like, figure out which, which uh, fungi has a really good lactase, Maybe do some genetic engineering, optimize it, drop it into your organism of choice, you produce it in a bioreactor, and then you pull it out and use it for bioremediation. So that's again sort of the general strategy for any kind of protein expression. So here's a little uh, cool map of a fungal biotech overview. Uh, my job is currently to do technical sales around the Bay Area. So I go into a lot of these next generation food companies and we sell them process sensors and cell counters and Bioreactor, the list goes on and on, but essentially I'm, I'm really looking at bioprocessing. I'm helping people, you know, take an organism, take a product, and put it through that whole sequence of getting it into their organism of choice, expressing their protein, purifying that, and then getting that into consumer goods. So we have a whole bunch of companies here in the Bay Area. There's a lot that are focusing on different types of consumer goods, coffees, jerky, ingredients, cosmetics, fashion, packaging, you know, you name it, there's probably somebody who's doing something with a mushroom out there. And there's hundreds of companies that aren't even on here because they're not counting, like, the big companies that do all that enzyme production for industrial process. I think for me, one of the most exciting ones is food. I don't know about you guys, but I'm pretty food driven. <laughs> That's part of how I got into mushrooms, right? My story was about puffballs and chicken in the woods. It wasn't 
with some colorful mushroom in this chip that I could eat. We, we hear a lot about sustainable microproteins, and I want to point out to you guys that there's actually been a sustainable microprotein on the market for the past like 30 years. It's called corn. You've probably seen it. If you have a vegan friend, you've probably eaten it. It's okay. It's not great. But what's really impressive about it is the way that they make it. This is this is a sort of schematic of a bioreactor, and this is what's called an airlift reactor. So this is like a 30 foot tall tank. And there's a, a bubbler down here, and it's filled with uh, fusarium, which is a little filamentous fungi. And as it grows, the flocks of fungi grow and get bigger, and they fall down. And if they're still small enough, the air bubble brings them back up. If they get big enough, if they fall out of solution, they're harvested off the bottom. They're um, heat treated because mushrooms have a lot of uric acid, and if we eat too much of it, that can be gout. So they heat treat it, and then they'll um, season it and package it, and we can buy it in stores corn. There's another great local company called Prime Roots. Uh, one of my buddies from Davis is their food scientist, and they're making some, I haven't actually tried this yet, but I've heard it's very good proximity to bacon and some other sort of microprotein meats. So that's stuff that's happening here. Clara Foods is a company that is taking egg proteins and sticking them in yeast and expressing various egg proteins for industrial food processes. Wild Earth is making koji vegan dog food. It's uh, impossible foods, you guys want to hear them. They are making a, a plant heme protein, but they can't, they're not producing plants because it's not scalable. So instead they've dropped that heme protein, which is kind of like blood, into a uh, yeast, and they're producing oodles of that, and that's what's in your impossible burger. We have two local mushroom farms that are pretty great. Farmers fungi is down in Moss Landing, and they grow a good selection of mushrooms. Most of the mushrooms that you can buy commercially are gonna be saprophytic mushrooms. That's mushrooms that grow on dead shit. And that's because you can take you know, wood, wood chips and you can inoculate them and consistently get good fruitings. You can't really grow commercially mycorrhizal mushrooms, not easily. You have to like inoculate the roots of trees, you have to wait like 10 years. Um, there are things called trufferies where they've now started doing this with black truffles. It takes a long time and it's kind of a spotty process. It doesn't always work. So no one is like, as far as I know, no one is commercially producing uh, stuff like chanterelles and porcini, but you can buy a whole range of really good things like shiitake and lion's mane and oyster mushrooms. Far West Okay does, they have the store in Santa Cruz and uh, at the Ferry Building, and they'll sell like wild mushrooms too. The other one is up in Sebastopol uh, called Gourmet Mushrooms in Mycopia. I think they have seven or eight different varieties they grow. It's a really fun farm tour if you ever get a chance to go on it. They have these you know, little jars, they inoculate them, they let them grow for like three months, and then they put them in these cooler rooms with high humidity and let them fruit. And you can buy some fantastic mushrooms. One thing to be careful of is grocery stores don't know how to deal with mushrooms. So you'll often see mushrooms on the shelf that should have been thrown away weeks ago. It's not the mushroom fault, farm's fault. It's the grocery store. They don't want to throw away inventory and they don't understand that a mushroom that's all like brown and twisted and crappy isn't good to eat anymore. They should be selling it to people, right? They'll, they'll put like beef on manager's special to get rid of it, but they're still charging like 15 bucks a pound for like a moldy mushroom. What you can do is always buy directly from, from these farms. And like I said, it's, it's a really sustainable uh, food source. I know at Mycopia, they can produce about a pound of mushroom protein for 12 gallons of water, which is staggering. So if you think about beef, for a pound of beef, it takes about 1,600 gallons of water for a pound of beef. Think about that on your, on your next hamburger, right? How much friggin' water, how many showers could you have taken for that hamburger? 12 gallons a pound of protein is pretty damn efficient. Not to mention, outside of meat, mushrooms are the only non-animal source of vitamin D. They're full of lots of beneficial polysaccharides. They're freaking tasty, right? So there's also micro materials. We have two local companies. We've got uh, Microworks and uh, Bolt Preds has recently purchased a license from Ecovated to start producing Milo, which is sort of a Mylar fake leather like product. Really excited to see both these things hit the supermarket. I can't wait to buy a mushroom couch. I think that's the jacket. I've been waiting my whole life to get like the dream leather jacket. Every time I go to the thrift store, I look and I never find one. Maybe, just maybe, when there's a mushroom, mushroom leather jacket, that'll be the one. So you'll see, you know, they can make blocks, you can make building materials, you know, packing materials, insulation. And that's good because these mushrooms are really hardy, they're robust. You know, when you cure these things the right way, they can, they can last for a long time. And why is that? Mushrooms are survivors, right? They have a lot of shit in the environment that is constantly trying to eat them. It's a tasty bit of protein and it's just sitting out there in the world. And what is the goal of a mushroom? A mushroom is like a, it's not quite like a flower, but it's a fruiting device, it's a spore dispersal structure. The actual mushroom is in the ground, it's the mycelium, 
So picking a fruiting vine doesn't, if you do it right, doesn't hurt the mycelium. And that's something a lot of people don't understand. If you don't watch the foraging and you adhere to a certain set of rules and practices, you're really not going to hurt the environment. You're not going to hurt the mushrooms. If anything, you're helping the mushrooms spread their spores by waving them around. So, so you know, you've got bacteria and archaea that want to eat it, mold, parasites, fungi, insects, snails, slugs, you know, mammals, including us, um, slime molds, and you have you know, hot, wet, cold, dry, UV, all sorts of stuff. Most mushrooms like to fruit when it's wet between about 40 and 60 degrees, so if you're outside of that window, it gets a little doggy. They're survivors. And why are they? Well, mushrooms are full of lots of gnarly compounds. They do a lot of secondary chemistry, and this, this is kind of an intimidating slide, but I mean, the point is there's a lot of compounds that are produced in mushrooms. They're a great place to mine antibiotics, cytotoxins, fungicides, you know, things to kill cancers. Just to point out two little ones up here. So this Illidan S, and this is a, a potential um, cancer drug. And it's because it's carcinogenic. This thing looks like a nucleotide base, and because of that, it will do, it will interpolate into your DNA, which is kind of the idea of like, it's gonna slide into the DMs of your DNA and cause an abortion, which can cause a double strand break, which is the worst kind of DNA damage you can get. So don't ever eat jack o mushrooms, because that's where that Illidan stuff is in. Um, so those are occasionally confused by chanterelles by newbies, so just always be really, really sure of your mushrooms before you ever try to eat something. And most importantly, if you're out on a mushroom before, especially with an expert, don't ask, can I eat this? Ask, what is this? Then you can ask, can I eat this? But just ask what it is, and that way at least your first question isn't, can I eat this? That's, that's a sign of a mushroom. And, and granted, I did that when I first started too, so don't be too afraid. Another one that's on here is this Omphalotin A, and that's again, so Omphalotus is the, you're probably saying that wrong, is the, uh, the genus for the jack o mushrooms. And this one kills nematodes, so little worms that live in the soil that are trying to eat mycelium. You know, it's not just the mushrooms that are full of this interesting secondary chemistry, it's all of the, the whole mushroom body of mycelium and everything it interacts with. So I mean, this is a good reason to preserve biodiversity too, right? There's cloud forests in Ecuador that have some of the highest biodiversity on the planet, amazing diversity of fungi, and every time, you know, something, somebody does logging, we could be losing how God knows how many cancer drugs or antibiotics or other things that we could be benefiting from. So there's real reason to preserve and, and care about mushrooms in our environment. Diversity of fungal polysaccharides, uh, there's a shitload of kinds of sugars in mushrooms. And this is part of what makes them hard to digest for a lot of stuff, right? There are a lot of different linkages. This gets incredibly complex. This is part of why mushrooms can subsist in the environment uh, because they have these complex linkages. It's also a big part of why they're so good for us to eat, uh, because all these little linkages can only be broken down by certain types of bacteria. So if you eat sugar, any bacteria can eat sugar, but it's the ones that grow the fastest that'll take over, and generally those aren't great for us, right? That's the high sugar, high fat, high salt, Western diet. And if you have one cheeseburger, I used to be able to eat in and out, I loved it, and now I can't. It just does me in for a week. So. I'm trying to stick to my high fiber foods and eating lots of mushrooms. We are all biological bioreactors. We're full of bacteria. There's more bacterial cells in your body than there are in periodic human cells. So treat them right, right? And eating mushrooms is a great way to feed healthy populations of those, of those bacteria. Those, those polysaccharides actually put your immune system on red alert, right? There's a lot of fungal pathogens. And in fact, the number of fungal pathogens is increasing in our environment as global warming spreads. Fungi, more people propagate and grow. We're more susceptible to more opportunistic human, fungi, and plant diseases. So eating lots of mushrooms will help activate through sort of cell signaling, cell transduction, don't worry about this stuff. It's, it's stimulating white blood cells like macrophages and neutrophils. And so it's just, it's putting your body on high alert and it's a good thing, it helps activate your immune system. I don't totally subscribe to the idea that you can ca catch all that through like a tincture, just eat mushrooms. Don't go out and spend 15 bucks on a little bottle, just eat mushrooms, They're, they taste better, and it's better for you. Plus there's fiber and all that stuff. Plus, yeah. Not, not drops. <gasps> anyway, so yeah, fungi. I, I love to focus on the phenology, photography, cookery, biochemistry, ecology, and, and uh, innovation. Um, these are some of my favorite pictures that I took in the past year. I'm hoping to get a lot more this year. I know my fiance wishes that I probably wouldn't go mushroom hunting quite as much, but it's part of what I love. For dinner, Brian, I'll come, come over and make me some cool food. Um, there's Gary being very impressed by some of the mushrooms we found. There's my friend Anna, went hunting with her on the East Coast this summer. Her handle is Breakfast of Champions. She's awesome, definitely give her a follow. <laughs> Thank you guys for listening. Uh, there's always the Mycelium Mash and Mushroom Meetups. Um, Mario got me out here one of those. It's a great group. 
Um, he does forays too. I don't generally do public forays. I consider it, but I just don't have a lot of time. Mario and Alan can take you guys out and have a good time. Um, Alan's speaking next, so definitely come back and see his talk. Um, if you work in biotech and you want to hang out, hit me up. I work for Flowtech. It's a sales rep company. We probably have something your company can buy. I'm happy to just have an excuse to go visit cool people. You can email me fastingbyfungi.gmail.com. If you like this shirt and you like one, uh, you can go on fastingbyfungi.com and buy one. Please, I really need money to help support the website. Uh, if I don't sell at least three shirts this month, I'm going to shut down the website. So please buy one. And then just for some, some mushroom stuff, I will see you later. So this, this is a... <laughs> This is what's known as a beefsteak fungi. So this is a brown rock polypore um, that grows in chinkabit oak. And as the name suggests, when you cut it open, it looks a hell of a lot like raw beef, especially when it's growing maggots. Um, it looks a lot like beef, but honestly, it has sort of a light lemony flavor. It's nice. Um, I really like it as an edible mushroom. Chinkabit oaks. And again, these are all videos from my Instagram. You can see them on there if you want to see them again. I'm hoping that the Science Channel will post this one tomorrow. That's been a really fun collaboration working with the Science Channel to uh, post educational content. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing more of that. And I'm hoping the Science Channel will tell them to be a TV show because that'd be rad. Um, we'll see. I just want to go mushroom hunting and make dinner with my friends and have them report. Like, hey, wouldn't that be fun? That's good. So we did this, this is a, a gyroporous cyanesses. It has a compound in it that gets bruised or injured, uh, and an enzyme will oxidize the uh, compound and make it turn blue, and then we drop on a little bit of KOH into the base, which causes an uh, increase in pH and then makes it go This little slug in time box. Yes, yeah, banana slug, go slugs. So nice. As a side note, don't lick these. If anyone tells you that it's fun, it's not. No, no don't do that. Um, it's, it's actually, I think it's got a bunch of, it's like hydrophobic, no, hydrophilic proteins that bind water really, really hard, and so it just like completely dehydrates your tongue, and you'll feel really like, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know if it does, but I've just seen other people deal with it. No. So these little globules are um, wolf's milk slime, or like a Really <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I've had a couple of here <laughs> I'm glad to send you guys out on a gross set, right? <laughs> so, if, if anyone has a TikTok, it's kind of a young person thing. I don't know why I'm going on it, but I have some hilarious TikTok videos from these things too, so check that out. Uh, if you like to be gross Anyway, thank you guys. Um, thank you so much.